Well, thank you very much for joining on behalf of the George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health, and particularly the Office of Research Excellence and the Bioethics Interest Group. I welcome you today to our 14th webinar on ethics and COVID-19. I'm really delighted, first of all, that all of you uh, return on a bi-weekly basis to attend these webinars. We are uh, absolutely privileged that uh, we can provide uh, the level of interaction and discussion on critical issues around bioethics and coronavirus. Today, I'm particularly excited because we are going to try and focus in on an age group and on a population that many of us consider extremely important and potentially vulnerable, uh, that is the adolescent years. And um, indeed, around the world, as we think about adolescent health, uh, COVID-19 has obviously strained both regular uh, issues around adolescent health, but in particular, also highlighted uh, specific issues that pertain to their health and welfare. And so I'm really delighted today that we will focus on the ethics issues around COVID-19 and adolescent health with two amazing personalities who cover um, information and knowledge from both um, the developed and developing country perspective. Um, before I introduce them, just to let you all know that we will, uh, I will invite both speakers to make opening comments. Um, and after that, I will go to uh, a quick Q&A mode. For those of you who've attended these before, I'm going to monitor the chat board. Uh, I will try and get to as many questions as possible, uh, but engage our panelists in a dialogue uh, uh, on these topics. Let me kickstart by welcoming uh, Professor Zulfikar Bhutta uh, to our webinar. Dr. Bhutta is the inaugural Robert Harding Chair in Global Child Health at the Hospital for Sick Children uh, and co-director of this Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health and founding director of the Center for Excellence in Women and Child Health at Aga Khan University in Pakistan. Um, he has joint appointments both in Canada and in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Bhutta is very well known to all of us in global health and particularly global child health. He has chaired the National Ethics Committee of the government of Pakistan and obviously uh, done a tremendous amount of work on various aspects of child health, including adolescent health. And today I look forward to hearing uh, his initial ideas and his work on adolescent health uh, from his perspective. Dr. Bhutta, um, Kathleen, if you can stop sharing this slide and allow Dr. Bhutta to share his screen. Um, over to you, Dr. Bhutta, for uh, your opening remarks. And you might be on mute, Dr. Bhutta, just if you could check that, I'll give you a sound check. So can you see my slides, if I may? Yes, and, and, we can uh, see us. And can you go on to the full screen mode, just confirm that you can see them? Yes, we can see your slide and we see you on a mode where we are seeing the slide and the next slide as well. So uh, if that mode is comfortable to you, we can move ahead. Now when you are in, Adnan, can you see the full slide? Um, I can see the full slide, but also the next slide, I'm assuming. Um, it okay, let, me, let me stop sharing. This is probably a, an issue with the mode. Can I stop sharing? for a moment and then yeah sure start. if you want to yeah sorry about that okay share again and let me know if it works yeah if you start sharing again it should work and could i ask uh kathleen or lauren to post information for our students on how to collect professional education hours in the chat board as well please and can you see the full slide now, Adnan? Um, Dr. Bhutta, it's still the same. I suggest you move ahead because we can see the slide well enough to read it. Go ahead. Okay. So, so firstly, uh, I'm delighted to, to be able to join you. It's actually a very interesting opportunity because I became an adjunct at GW just before COVID hit, and I've been looking for an opportunity to share some thoughts with all of you. I present these things. Uh, under my name, but they're largely the work of a large working group. And in particular here, I'm indebted to a number of young professionals who work with me both here in Canada and across continents in Africa and Asia. And they're all named here, who are part of the COVID working group that I established. What I'll do over the next 10 minutes is basically cover the issue of why adolescent health, uh, why particularly adolescent health in reference to COVID-19, 
I'll share some preliminary data from the uh, work that we've conducted on direct and indirect effects in South Asia. And I'll finish with some thoughts on what does it mean for ethics and equity. Some years ago, when I was on the independent expert review group of the WHO, looking at this, we made a point just before the MDGs closed that adolescents were completely neglected and there were no adolescent specific outcomes in the global strategy. Uh, they were neither parts of discussion, nor was there any accountability. And this was particularly jarring because it's such a huge number. And not only are these 1.2 billion adolescents living in low and middle income countries, uh, they are also largely in that geography, contributing to a major burden of morbidity and mortality in this particular age group. And some of that is recognizable through the statistics that you see. Close to around 20,000 girls give birth every day. These are girls under 18. Uh, they also die in large numbers from complications resulting from pregnancy and childbirth and also 3 million plus unsafe abortions occur in them. There's also an equity issue around adolescence. And if you look at the proportion of, of births that take place in girls under 18 years of age, you can see the gradient here. It's largely a problem of the poorest of the poor. And, uh, and particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, children having children is a phenomenon that many people recognize. Now in COVID-19, these are figures from last night. Uh, you know, from a circumstance where we thought this would be just a threat, we now have almost 38 million cases worldwide and over a million deaths. So there is a huge impact that this has had on the lives and livelihoods of people. And it's ubiquitous. It's across the world. No part of the world has been immune from the effects of COVID-19, both direct and indirect. And sadly, while we capture the statistics, as you see here, as direct effects of COVID, uh, deaths, hospitalizations, serious illnesses, there is relatively less recognition of the indirect effects. And when the jury is out in due course, we will probably find out that the indirect effects, both on mortality, were higher than the direct effects of the, of, of the disease itself. We have recently looked at this as part of our, our work on uh, children and adolescents with UNICEF. And, and just to summarize in one slide, overall, while younger children are not a large proportion of the COVID-19 disease burden. In many geographies, and here it's captured from case series from China, from the US and, and Europe, uh, they are not an insignificant proportion of the COVID-19 burden. They're also uh, a, an important component of the transmission, as we are recognizing as schools reopen, that risk of transmission for children in adolescence and high schools is about the same as that of young adults. So they are a very important group in terms of our mitigation strategies and overall approach. But what about the indirect effects? We looked at this in depth in South Asia in the six countries that we have evaluated and to use the framework that we used, uh, we had to start with why South Asia? And South Asia is equally important because it has close to 2 billion people. A large number of those are live below poverty. Uh, it has around one in eight half a million deaths of children under five, which are about a third of the global burden, and uh, it has a large proportion of adolescents. And therefore, it would be logical for us to imagine that the impact of COVID-19 would be clustered in this population. Overall, if you, if you look at the disease burden itself, uh, uh, you see that a large proportion of deaths are clustered in India. These are uh, COVID-19 deaths cumulative on a logarithmic scale. Uh, but you also have the burden of the disease reflected in other countries in, in the region, with perhaps the exception of Sri Lanka. It's a little better to see this in actual numbers. When you look at the actual numbers, although many countries appear to be flattening uh, the curve based on data available, India has still got a huge problem as it tries to overcome this. Now, this would give you a sense that maybe the proportion of people affected largely from COVID-19 would be in relation to the actual burden itself, but that's not the case. Very early on in the pandemic, uh, mitigation strategies were put in place, such as lockdowns, such as things that impacted movements, employment, educational institutions, and these are captured in this so-called stringency index, which is the severity of response by countries. And to cut a long story short, in South Asia, 
Virtually by the middle of April, March, almost all countries had put in stringent responses, principally locking in their population. And that lasted for well over two months. And only now do you have some countries relaxing and it's not complete. In many places, schools are still not open, but in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, things are beginning to become a little bit more normalish. So the interest was to see what could be happening in this space with these indirect effects. And if you look at the graphic that relates the indirect effects, uh, you would recognize that it is not just due to the interruption of services around health, immunizations, it's also interruption of education, economic activity, food insecurity, and some consequences that are specific to adolescent girls. So we used a model that I'll not go through in detail to estimate what was the impact on maternal and child mortality. I just presented the final results of these data this morning. And we are looking at a 10 to 15% increase in mortality by the end of this year for women and children. But there are also other figures that you should see here, which is the proportion of unintended pregnancies, about a 10%, 11% increase, and a 29% increase in unsafe abortions. And this is across the board, across those countries, based on actual data available. This is not model data. This is actual information from health systems. In terms of uh, education, about 400 million children, school age children are out of school in South Asia since March. Some have begun to return, but it's not complete. And they are largely reflective of the inequities that exist between urban and rural populations. And the impact of this down the road in terms of educational achievement and development will be enormous. It will also be disproportionate in terms of girls. And we estimate that around four and a half million girls will drop out of school and adolescents who drop out of schools generally end up by getting married early or being married early. And it's also associated as you can see in this particular table with a number of adverse outcomes. Although I generally feel uh, that we should not be measuring adolescent adverse effects only through pregnancy or birth outcomes, but the impact on their lifelong uh, uh, trajectory is enormous. Uh, we have looked at some of the direct costs of this in terms of the short term, and that's enormous, but in terms of long-term costs in loss, it's in billions of dollars. To summarize, therefore, COVID-19 and adolescence, as, as I close, uh, these are the silent victims of the COVID-19 pandemic right now because they don't have a voice. And the general long-term consequences of some of this in adolescence, particularly those who will drop out of education, the girls who will be married off early will have intergenerational consequences. These are things that could last generations easily. The loss of schooling uh, will impact health, nutrition, but also things that relate to mental health and gender-based violence which will last well beyond the current pandemic. So we, when we look at consequences, it is not just things by the end of the year or middle of next year. It are things that will go for much longer. Um, they are also at risk because they are outside of the social safety net. In South Asia in particular, most adolescents are not eligible for social safety net payments because they are underage and, uh, and are not necessarily the heads of their own households. So therefore their ability to get benefits, particularly for boys who are in the formal or informal employment sector is next to zero. And, and this is a very important consideration in terms of adolescents that will be moving into poverty. Why is this important from an ethics perspective? Because clearly inequities are unethical anywhere. Unequal societies, are societies that lose a lot of their moral compass. And therefore we believe that the issue of adolescent boys and girls in South Asia in relation to their losses in the medium to short term due to the COVID pandemic represents an enormous global ethical and moral challenge. And it's not just for South Asia, it's also for Africa. Our work is just illustrative. And I hope that in the discussion, we can discuss a little bit as to what could be the specific mitigation strategies that target adolescents in this population. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhutta. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great overview, not only of um, 
of the status of COVID-19 and its impact on adolescent health, but I really appreciated <clears throat> highlighting the framework of the silent victims. You're highlighting the fact that uh, implications that we don't think of, four and a half million girls dropping out of school, children dropping out of school, 10 to 15% increases in mortality and unintended pregnancies. That is, that is very, very impressive. But also a reminder that the impact doesn't stop today. It will continue for many years to follow. So we'll come back to some of those points, Dr. Bhutta. Um, uh, but thank you for setting the stage. And I'm now really delighted to welcome uh, Professor Ann Strode. I'm gonna request Kathleen to put up uh, Dr. Strode's slides. Um, Dr. Strode is Professor of Law at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, she, of course, not only uh, engages and teaches in law and, and, and bioethics to both undergraduate and graduate students, but she's also an advocate of the High Court. Um, Dr. Strode has had uh, many, many research interests, but particularly to our context, um, she's interested in the sexual and reproductive rights of adolescents and indeed has been mentoring uh, and researching on, on the impact of uh, young people and obviously brings with her uh, the perspective of ethics committees as well. So Dr. Strode, over to you for your opening reflections. Thank you. And thank you for this invitation to participate in this um, seminar today. So if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to, I think our presentations really are going to dovetail very well because by way of background, tonight um, from my, um, I'd like to really look at the ethical issues from a um, human rights lens. So we know that ethics and law are, are really interlinked, that with law being setting norms that can be enforced, and ethics obviously being um, more of a, a moral um, principles that we which are in some cases in, indirectly enforceable by law um, or place obligations. It, uh, human rights are really in the middle of that because human rights, again, since, nine, since um, 1948, with the adoption of the, well, the issuing of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have the set of, of fundamental rights which may not be in fact protected in all legal systems, but they are there as a set of guidelines for what are minimum entitlements that every human ought to, to have. And there is a very strong link between public health and human rights because we cannot achieve our public health goals without protection of human rights. Because if people do, if their rights to, for example, housing or water or food are not met, then um, it's very difficult to, in fact, have um, a sort of public health system. And certainly, um, COVID-19 raises many human rights issues. Next slide, please. So this, this table is just some of the examples of the link between the risk factors that people face to COVID-19, some of the impacts, and then the um, human rights issues. So I'll just um, speak about one, because um, being based in Africa, this is obviously a key problem for us, is that people live in um, overcrowded and informal settlements which violates their rights to adequate housing and obviously increases their risks to, um, to COVID-19 because of their living conditions, their inability to um, be able to socially isolate, to have access to clean running water for sanitization, etc. Next slide, please. So if we, if we accept that there is a, um, that our responses to COVID-19 have a rights impact. Then let's shift our focus to adolescents. And I'm just going to look at two rights, both of which have been mentioned already, and to look at the sorts of issues that um, our response to the epidemic has had on these rights issues. So if we look at education, the Convention on the Rights of the Child provides that every child has a right to education. And this right has certainly been violated in our responses to COVID-19. We've had the prolonged 
closure of schools, as we've just heard. Dr. Strode, you went on mute. I'm, I'm assuming by mistake. Um, you yes, it was by mistake. Sorry, so we've had the prolonged closure of schools, and this, as has been already mentioned, has a disparate impact on adolescents from impoverished homes. So in my own context in South Africa, one of the key impacts has been that the school feeding scheme, which exists for children, obviously was interrupted by the lockdown and children not going to school and therefore not getting their one main meal a day. We've also, as also mentioned, we've seen a widening of the education gap because um, children from impoverished homes don't have spaces to study, they don't have access to data, they often don't have access to materials that they're able to use to continue with the education. Whereas children from more resourced schools um, were able to continue with schooling because of having access to online schooling provided throughout the period. Next slide, please. Again, with health, the right to health is founded primarily in the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and as well as um, it's reflected in Article 24 of the Convention of the, right down, um, of the Rights of the Child. And we've seen that, particularly with adolescents, obviously lockdowns have limited movements. It has um, required people, adolescents to be restricted to their homes and to not go out. So this has had a direct impact on their rights to access primary health care, um, including rights to access, for example, contraceptives, HIV testing. And we've already heard about the indirect impact that that's having on um, unintended pregnancies, etc. It's also the problem with health is that health systems have been under pressure generally. And one of the criticisms certainly of their responses has been that they've limited services to emergency services and therefore there have been um, less access to, um, for example, um, in South Africa, less access to the HPV vaccine, which has been given through schools, so it hasn't been provided this year. There have been interruptions of HIV, TB treatment, um, etc., all of which are impacting on that right to health. Next slide, please. So if we look at those, just the, those are just two of the rights violations that have occurred. Um, in this particular, in our, with our responses to, to COVID-19. I mean, there are many more that we could discuss. One is, for example, in our own, my own situation in South Africa, we have used the criminal law, um, I feel very inappropriately, in order to enforce all of our um, public health norms. People who failed to wear masks, got fined, uh, um, if you live a, um, an acceptable reason for that, again, you could be fined, um, even face imprisonment. So there a whole range of human rights issues, but I think for adolescents, it's really education and health that we ought to focus on. So I thought for the purposes of this seminar, let me try and um, pose uh, some questions that we could discuss. So if we think of access to primary health care during lockdowns for adolescents, I mean, these are, it's extremely important that adolescents are able to access these services, and they certainly have that right um, in terms of international law and in many domestic legal systems. But obviously the complexity is that um, because adolescents are confined to their homes, and their parents may not be aware that they're accessing these services could ordinarily they would have accessed these services on their own they would have on their way to school or when they're home um, on their way home etc now that obviously with being confined to their homes with their parents or caregivers they would need to provide a reason why they're going to the clinic or the healthcare services and this obviously has a rights implication as we've discussed so I wanted to pose the question of how do we balance then this access to services for a low risk group with the fact that 
adolescents are nevertheless transmitters and they may pose a risk to others in their homes, um, households, you know, older persons, grandparents, and particularly in um, in, in African context where generally households are intergenerational and there will be older people within the household. So how do we try and um, balance that? Also with other issues that I'd be interested to hear your um, discussion on, such as adolescent privacy. I mean, adolescents have those rights to privacy around accessing healthcare. And in this context of a lockdown, it becomes extremely difficult. So. Um, what would be the ethical issues that we'd need to take into consideration in trying to find that kind of balance? Next slide, please. Again, um, now this time uh, relating to um, another issue relating to health is the that of even though we know that adolescents are not at risk of severe disease, what will it mean in what given that they're not in a high risk group what will it mean in terms of access to a future vaccine will they be included in studies so for example in south africa at the moment they are not being excluded included we are only enrolling um, persons over the age of 18 in our current studies if we do enroll children in vaccine studies in the future, will parental consent be required? And will that be an obstacle for adolescents um, in terms of enrollment in research? Also, if we look even further forward, if we look at the rollout of a vaccine in the future, Will there even be in a group that is going to be prioritized for um, a vaccine? Will it be provided, like at the moment in South Africa, the only older vaccine that is given through our state system is HPV. That is provided through our state schooling system. So is this also going to be a, would this be rolled out through schools? And if so, um, what does it mean for our adolescents who are out of school, who have dropped out, etc.? So, in the context of limited resources and limited capacity to provide sufficient vaccines, um, to what extent will we include ad adolescents in vaccine research as well as distribution plans? And what are the ethical issues that relate to those questions? Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Strode. Really appreciate uh, that perspective. And thank you for bringing in the intersection between health, human rights, and ethics, um, and reminding us about those two fundamental issues around education and, and health. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard both our panelists. Please put up your questions and comments and reflections in the chat board. Um, I certainly have been stimulated to ask a few questions myself of our panelists. I'll request Dr. Strode and Dr. Bhutta to be available. Um, and uh, I particularly uh, want to combine these questions with COVID-19 and um, uh, a disagreement. Please uh, post it. Um, so thank you to both of you. Uh, for highlighting this issue, and maybe Dr. Bhutta, just to just to start with you, um, you talked uh, considerably uh, about uh, the reality of the health impacts on adolescents. Um, but could you speak a little bit more to the mental health, psychological uh, types of impacts that, uh, in fact, may not even be currently measured? What are your perspectives or, or thoughts around that? Uh, not just in your region, but uh, uh, around the world with respect to adolescents? So, so Adan, that's the big question as to whether or not we have the metrics or measures to quantify it like we do many other things, access to services, facility births, you know, even things like education. Uh, so firstly, in our, the vast majority of information that we have in our global databases is from cross-sectional surveys. So one point to note for everybody is that there haven't been any surveys actively since the pandemic hit. Uh, 
And much of the information that we are collating very painstakingly is from uh, innovative designs from district health information systems. And the last thing that you have in those information systems is anything to do with mental health. So the answer to your question is, even in the best of times, we have no more than indirect measures of this from rep non-representative samples. And now with post-pandemic, all we have is qualitative studies that have indicated uh, there is a survey done in Bangladesh, for example, which is the only one which has done a before-after panel as part of routinely planned activities within one section of the population. And they've identified, again, not quantified, identified quite a significant increase in domestic violence and mental health issues. So the reports on this are anecdotal, but their direction of effect and what we know from past experience of uh, locking children and families up in a closed environment is, <coughs> is that these things only go in one direction. And that generally is excess of uh, the interpersonal violence, gender-based violence, sexual abuse, and uh, this has been recognized in many different contexts. Yeah. So I can't put a figure onto it, but what I can tell you is that adolescents are particularly vulnerable because they are like newborns were a long time ago, orphaned between obstetricians and pediatricians. So adolescents are at times treated like young adults. They don't like being treated like older children. The health services are not at all adolescent friendly, even though policies may exist. And particularly for adolescent girls, seeking services for sensitive issues, uh, dealing with reproductive health, the last yeah. person that they want to be seen going to in the South Asian context is an obstetrician gynecologist. Yeah. So we just do not, or a male physician. So we have tremendous barriers in terms of care seeking for adolescents, especially for Great girls. Point. And for mental health, uh, or, or as you know, ordinarily services are generally limited just given human resource shortages. And, uh, and therefore, in terms of the hierarchy of where the gaps are greatest, Adolescents are also at risk because so many are out of school. At least for many school-going children, you have a school health program where some issues can be picked up. So I feel particularly that this is a scenario in which COVID-19 has opened the eyes of many people for a glaring gap in our routine health system, in our response systems, in our community support strategies, and also in the repertoire of activities of our community health workers. Our Thank community you. health workers, which are out there in large numbers, ASHA workers, lady health workers, BRAC workers, have just not been equipped for dealing with adolescents yeah. in a substantive way. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bhutto. I completely agree that uh, certainly the health system, uh, this appears to be both in terms of the risk group, as well as some of the issues you've highlighted, a huge gap. Dr. Strode, you talked about, for example, the provision of primary health care services. Um, I want to, based on a comment on the chat board, ask you your perspective of the roles of international agencies around this issue. What is their role in terms of protecting vulnerable people like adolescents uh, in times of COVID? And do you think that that role is being currently uh, conducted or not? I think largely, especially in the work that I do, it's around international agencies helping us set those the normative frameworks which can then be applied at a country level. And so I think that's where, for example, the agencies such as WHO have been so useful in linking health and human rights and setting those norms and, and having that principle at the foreground of their work that all of, all of our health responses are grounded in human rights. But I haven't seen an an adolescent um, response from the WHO ar around COVID-19. So I think there, that's the gap. They haven't been, and perhaps it's just because we are living through an emergency, that there hasn't been the time to address the groups that are not, perhaps haven't been highlighted as being the, those most at risk. Um, and as it's been pointed out, it's not only the direct um, persons directly affected by this epidemic. It's the indirect effects that we need to focus on. And that, I think, has been a big gap. So we haven't had that kind, there hasn't been that kind of support for countries at a domestic level. 
Yeah, no, thank you. I think I think that you're absolutely right. This is hitting us so rapidly. It's it's unbelievable that it's actually only six months, and we have, um, you know, at least in the country I'm speaking from, over two hundred and ten thousand deaths. Some people may not actually believe that, but it is true. Um, so, Dr. Butta, what is the situation in other parts? Some of the some of our participants were, since you specifically highlighted South Asia. Do you have any more information from other parts of the world? Is it very similar to what you described in South Asia or is it different? Um, or, or is it something that you haven't really looked at at this stage? No, we've, we've looked at. So, so first of all, uh, if the question is around COVID-19 and its impact, direct effects, then uh, generally there is limited information from many geographies which have not been able to test at the level of scale that was recommended initially by WHO or countries like United States have done. And I'll tell you why. It's because it is hugely expensive. Our, our country of origin, Pakistan, has already in the six months since it started testing uh, at any level uh, since March, has spent a hundred million rupees on a uh, hundred million dollars, sorry, on, uh, on COVID-19 testing. And this is for a country where this is easily more than the health budget of several provinces combined uh, for this year. And this is because uh, they were asked to do so. There is very little correlation between level of testing and your ability to control a pandemic, as you know from the US. I mean, you've tested more than any other country in the world, yet where is your uh, epidemic right now? So what was needed was a lot more targeted approach to testing clearly, et cetera. But what we do know is where there is mortality tracking, where you have graveyard surveillance and where you know that you, uh, most burials are things that you can't hide, uh, that there hasn't been that kind of an excess mortality that people were envisaging would happen in South Asia. As uh, many people know, this has also been a time period where uh, the modelers and many epidemiologists have had a field day and have also lost enormous credibility because of the doom and gloom scenarios in terms of projecting millions of deaths happening in various parts of the world that never took place. So it is to recognize also the diversity in global uh, pandemic. I'll give you the example of Sri Lanka. So as Adnan knows, enormously well-developed primary care systems and information systems in a country, an island, uh, but a reasonable population. Guess what's the total number of COVID-19 deaths in Sri Lanka since the outset of the pandemic? It's less than 20. And that's one of the reasons we could never model Sri Lanka because the models just never converge uh, because it is principally nothing out there in terms of a gross disorder that could have been missed. And Kerala is about the same in India. There's very little disease burden. So there are some systems that have been able to dampen this. In Africa, the projections in terms of millions of deaths in Africa, I, can't, I think South Africa has had some burden, but again, in South Africa, the disease has not gone around like wildfire. And, and my, my colleague and friend, Slim Kareem, will talk about this uh, several times to say that we don't quite understand why some of these dimensions are different. But what we do know in South Asia is that they, despite the diversity, India has a huge burden right now. Pakistan has a large number of cases, but not the large number of deaths. And both countries together have not translated into the number of deaths beyond a case fatality rate of around 2% that you would have anticipated elsewhere. So there are differences in the epidemic. And that does give us some hope that we may be able to learn how to live with it. We are not going to be able to beat it into oblivion, but just to live with it, adjust and adapt as necessary. No, thank you, Dr. Bhatta. I know some people... Could, could I add something? Please, please, uh, Dr. Stewart, come on in. Because I think what's important to also recognize, just based on that last point, that we have to live with this epidemic, is that this epidemic, this pandemic, is teaching us, is showing the vast inequities across the globe. And it is showing us that, and these are things that cannot be fixed quickly. So the, for example, in my own context in South Africa, the lack of sanitation at schools, the lack of um, access to the internet and to data, 
that, that loss of education of what it's going to actually mean for the future generations who've lost an entire year at school. We may have future pandemics, and if we don't address the underlying causes of disease and the disparate impact that disease has on communities living in poverty, we, we will never be able to respond um, appropriately. So the responses going forward, our health system cannot simply look at health and responding to health. We're going to have to also look at those underlying factors such as the living conditions that people are in, their access to nutrition, their access to water, that those are going to have to look, be looked at in a more human rights and holistic way going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that is what the human rights angle and the ethics angle allows us to see. Dr. Stroh, just to push you a little bit on commenting, then also um, using the same line of thinking, that colleges, universities, schools have become, in fact, not only the issue around education and educational deprivation, but also are considered risks in terms of COVID-19. There's also concerns around blaming younger people like adolescents and youth um, because of the carrier state that they can have. Do you have any perspectives around that? How do we handle this? Uh, from from your perspective in terms of either human rights or, or, or an ethics So then I think we have to distinguish between, yes, there's certainly evidence that young people that um, are transmitters of the disease in, in places of entertainment, etc. But I think we would distinguish an education space from that. An education space is very controlled and regulated and the schools are able to enforce um, and even at a university, we are able to, at my own university, we're able to have social distancing, we're able to have requirements around masks. And so you are far more able to control that environment than you are in a social setting, for example, where there's alcohol, um, et cetera, drugs, where it's far more likely that people may not necessarily follow public health recommendations. So I think one must make that distinction in the first place. And then one must then, I think, given the importance of education and the impact that education has on a person's long-term um, health and other outcomes, it's absolutely critical that we find ways that, that, that an adolescent's right to education is not compromised, particularly because Adolescents are often a lot more vulnerable to dropping out of school than those who are in, in a primary education um, sector or setting. So once you get to about 12, their dropout rate starts to increase considerably. So we really do have to focus on adolescents. Um, and as it's been said, especially around adolescent girls, that we're having increased um, unintended pregnancies, etc perhaps even a, an increase in the rate of hiv infection that is going to have a, there will be a gender dynamic to that um, and that as a rights issue we must consider thank you very much and i think that that's very very important and as some of the comments are coming on the chat obviously schools are the source of many many more things than just providing um, simple education but the source of picking up many issues as well Dr. Butta, to come back to something and, and maybe ask your perspectives on, since there is concern about um, mental health, the issues of access, even concerns in the high-income countries around increasing trends we see in, in suicide and self-harm, what about using technology? Uh, what are your perspectives in terms of um, mobile health, digital health, e-health? and uh, to try to resolve some of these barriers, particularly right now when face-to-face -face interactions are, are limited? I think they offer enormous opportunities. And, and just to pick on what, what Anne was saying, I think we should look at all of this, not from a lens of doom and gloom, but also as the unique opportunity it offers at a point in time for principally jump-starting and, and fast-tracking some of the uh, reform that we need to have both within our health, education, and social protection systems. And these things are interrelated. I completely concur that the lens that you need to look at vulnerable populations has got to be bigger than health. Uh, 
And this is a, if COVID-19 wasn't an opportunity to fix water sanitation hygiene in our institutions, in our hospitals, in our schools, uh, and in general, I don't think of anything else that's out there. So I do anticipate that there will be some benefits. There are some unintended benefits already out there, uh, non as you know. Air quality has improved in many places during lockdowns. The number of road traffic accidents and injuries is down. So, so there are some benefits out there that we could capitalize on. So coming back to your specific question, uh, I, I think technology, particularly information gathering and technology in relation to health communications has received a tremendous shot in the arm. So already, even from people who were not even able to negotiate a simple app on their phones, they're now undertaking teleconferences and Zoom consultations and, uh, and telemedicine. Uh, I see this all the time with family medicine and other colleagues, and this in many geographies is the bridge to divide in terms of providing remote and rural care, number one. Number two, it also empowers communities. So it's not just health providers, it also empowers communities. And, and one thing that we need to maybe capitalize on, particularly for adolescents, is the right to communication. As you know, in many parts of South Asia, girls in particular don't necessarily own cell phones because it's used as one means of, of control by families who uh, will think that this is maybe providing too much independence, autonomy, or, or risks. Uh, they're communicating with other people or other boys, and that's something that we need to rectify. The last thing I would say to you is not only data collection systems have been totally dependent upon cell phones, but there is one aspect that I would personally like to see scale up in South Asia, and it's a great opportunity. And that's uh, a, a helpline for adolescents or young people at risk of cell phone. Now, this is uh, only just beginning to come in with some uh, uh, big cities offering what is called a suicide risk line. It's something that we have been thinking about for a while, and I think COVID-19 offers an opportunity to make that available at scale. Uh, because as you're well aware, uh, many of these particularly self-harm uh, incidents are a cry for help. The differences between boys and girls in terms of who succeeds at, at this is also very well recognized. The incidence of self-harm may be higher in girls, but the incidence of successful suicide is much higher in boys. And therefore, to have something available as a counseling line, as an SOS, as somewhere where they can report abuse, and they can also seek uh, in, private, in private and in confidence support is something that we absolutely need to see implemented and implemented at scale. And technology offers us that, uh, you know, where it could not before. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. I think those are all very, very important perspective, both from a diagnostic viewpoint, from a, um, but from an interventional uh, viewpoint as well. So Dr. Strode, I want to come back to you because um, a couple of folks have highlighted the role of schools, um, even in giving out meals. <laughs> Um, uh, food for children, and that's true for South Africa, and it is also true right here in the United States, where when schools closed, some children who were dependent on their breakfast and lunch for... Um, uh, so, obviously, that can't be done electronically. That's not something we can convert to digital. But what are your perspectives on how do we get the policymakers then to, to think very carefully about this? You obviously those dialogues. Talk to us a little bit about that. So I think particularly in developing countries such as South Africa and our neighbors in Africa, we cannot we cannot take an whilst I agree that the technology gives us such an opportunity, but then it it really requires far greater advocacy around access to that te technology. Because at the moment technology is really being used to advantage those who have access to it. And <clears throat> so in a country of such enormous inequality such as Africa, it is only a few that have access to that technology. So quite, and that is why, for example, that, um, that we have to find ways that 
we are not going to be able to roll out technology immediately, that we have to find safe ways of children to go back to school. I mean, there were a number of um, important initiatives that were undertaken with the school feeding scheme. So, for example, the um, in certain parts of the country, they um, packed up the school lunches and children went and fetched them every day. Um, this in order to at least continue to provide that particular service. So I think we have to look at technology and that's our goal and gives us opportunities and we must use it as much as possible. But at the same time, we have to realize that we, we are not all there. And so we actually have to have some safe physical interaction in order to ensure that those um, children who, who don't have access to technology or nutrition are able to come to a safe place. And the, many of the schools can be made into safe environments. We, for example, here in Africa, we have, we have a, um, a very um, mild climate generally. We are able to have windows wide open. We have, um, we are children, a difficulty obviously is overcrowding and in under-resourced schools, they don't have other facilities, aren't able to, as they've done in resourced schools, where they've split classes, etc. But we are able to have other solutions. Some of the schools have successfully pioneered children going to school in alternate weeks, or only certain grades going to school at on a day. But perhaps Monday is only three grades, and on Tuesday is two grades. So there are many ways, where even when people um, are not confined to their homes, yeah. where they can still go into that social space in a safe way because for us we are not going to get through this pandemic by keeping everyone at home keeping the most vulnerable children at home will in fact be um, of great disadvantage to them because they will not get they will they do not have access to them any education at all if you imagine a family living in an informal settlement in a single room you may have up to eight people living in that room it's not possible to even if you had a device to have quiet time in order to to do your schoolwork Dr. Strode, while I have you I'm going to give you one more minute for a closing comment and I wonder if you can touch on the issue of the politicization of our response to COVID from your perspective in South Africa. Uh, a minute on that, and then I'll uh, switch over to Dr. Murta. So I think there, South Africa is actually a good example because um, it's already been mentioned that um, uh, Professor Slim Karim, for example, has been the leader of our um, ministerial advisory committee. So we've really seen, and South Africa has such a poor, has had a history of political involvement in health because under the apartheid system, people were denied health for political reasons. We had a very poor HIV response because we had a president who was an AIDS denialist. So for us, it's actually been turning the corner because it's the first time we've seen our government response being um, strongly advised and strongly based on science. And I think that's part of why we've had lower infection rates. Our response has been better than our response to many other diseases. I'm, I'm hoping that it'll continue because it has had positive human rights um, implications. Yeah. No, thank you very much, Dr. Strode. Dr. Burta, I want you to also comment on the politicization of the COVID response. But before you do, I'm going to give you two minutes, one minute on that and another minute on if you can just say a quick word on adolescents in refugee camps. I, I, uh, I know that Gerald uh, is a regular contributor to our webinars. I, I don't want to ignore his question, but maybe a, a, a minute on that and then a minute on that uh, on politicization. I could go on this forever. So, so I, I thank you for the question. Of course, anything that I have said in relation to COVID impact or other impacts in populations which are fragile, uh, which are on the move, uh, which are displaced or uh, or in conflict zones is just multiplied several times fold because you're dealing with a data-less environment or an informationless environment. Uh, that's one of the reasons why 
our world in data has stopped modeling many things from Afghanistan because the data is so patchy. That's not to say the problem does not exist. We know that the problem exists and we know that there has been issues and response and 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 uh, limited response of this in Somalia and Yemen and in other places. So the answer is all that I've said about vulnerability of adolescence. The patient in, was independently seen and examined with uh, the practitioner. Is, is, uh, is, is multiplied several folds uh, in uh, conflict settings. Um, I, there are lots of questions. We'll attempt to can, use um, hemiodron for chemical some, cardioversion, comma, however. Somebody, um, somebody is unmuted. <laughs> Aaron, can you please mute Dr. Kuzbe? Thank you. Yep. Right, Dr. So, so I'm happy to be taught cardioversion again. It's been years <laughs> since I've been the but uh, so coming back to the issue, uh, there are lots of questions in the chat and number from Francis that I would, uh, you know, have been happy to answer. We have to keep our optimistic lens on. There, to every challenge, there is an opportunity. And yes, of course, many children have lost enormous time. We, many populations have seen great deprivation uh, in, in our region in South Asia, the families have been uprooted from urban to rural settings. Many have had to walk hundreds of kilometers. Some actually even died making their way. Yeah. All of that is an enormous human tragedy. Yeah. But we've got to lift those people up and move on. And we've got to build on some of what we recognize as populations which are especially vulnerable. So, so I think there is an opportunity in here not to downplay the enormity of the human tragedy. But what are the lessons out there, Fatnan? So you and I have worked for decades with the global normative bodies. So the global normative body here was caught virtually without a toolkit at hand to handle yeah. many things. And I think when the autopsy of this is done and the history of COVID-19 is written down, it wouldn't just be the failure of policymakers and governments. It would also be the failure of the global normative bodies. And I will not name them. They don't have to be WHO only, but others. It sure. failed to rise to the challenge. Sure. And not only that, who failed to maintain their scientific integrity and autonomy in the wake of politicization of a response. Yeah. That I think also will be an indictment. And it's both at global level and at national level. Yeah. So I think that leadership that needs to come to the public health community is something that we will reflect upon for a long period of time. Thank uh, you. So that, to answer the question, uh, we are running short of time, but life. yeah. No, thank you very much. And, and I am going to simply second what you just said. And certainly the US is one of those examples where, where the politicization debate has paid off. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, um, I hope that this conversation around adolescent health ethics and COVID-19 has been constructive and useful for you. Um, I couldn't have imagined a better conversation with Professors Anstrode uh, from South Africa and Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta from Canada and Pakistan. I want to remind everyone that in two weeks, on October 27th, our next Ethics in COVID-19 webinar is actually on South Asia. We will have Professors Farad Mazdam from Pakistan and Dr. Anand Ban from India having a dialogue, not just obviously on, on children, but on what are the ethics issues that COVID-19 has impacted uh, for that region. Please remember, we are doing a world tour. We, we did East Asia last month, this, this month it's South Asia. We'll be moving over to Africa very soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Berta and Dr. Strode for sharing the time with us um, and being so instrumental in our learning. Truly appreciate your presentations and your thoughts. Uh, and thank you all for joining, uh, particularly those of you who have become regulars on this. This was our 14th webinar. We look forward to welcoming you all on our 15th in exactly two weeks. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. And be Thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.